Hello, and welcome to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast, the show where we help you establish your author brand, increase the size of your audience, and sell more books. I'm Lindsay Baroker, and I'm here with both of my co-hosts this week. I'm Jeff Poole. And I'm Joe Lalo. All right, and we're recording at a different time than usual because we have a guest from the UK, and we were trying to avoid the 4th of July here in the US yesterday. So our guest, though, is a really good one, Joanna Penn. And uh, you guys probably all know her and probably all listen to her podcast, The Creative Pen, already. But just in case you don't know her, Joanna writes th thrillers and nonfiction titles such as Successful Self-Publishing, How to Make a Living with Your Writing, and How to Market a Book. And that last one is coming out with a third edition uh, tomorrow. And so we're going to have her on today to kind of talk about it and just give a lot of advice on marketing basics and, and launching your first book. And, and we're also going to ask her about selling more internationally and maybe some translations and things. Cause Joanna, you're, you're kind of the queen of international sales. You're always really excited about like selling in India and, and all those places and on the Kobo map. And, and I am too, I, I would love to sell more books everywhere, but uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and, and say hi. Yeah, well, it, and I think I'm kind of the poster girl for international because like you guys are all American and all focusing on America. So I have to always bring in the international side of things. But um, yeah, I write thrillers, as you say, although uh, Lindsay and I were in New Orleans um, back in March, co-writing the sacrifice, American Demon Hunter sacrifice. And Lindsay told me I actually write fantasy. Uh, <laughs> so since then, I'm like, what kind of author am I? Ah, so maybe we can talk about cross genre marketing, which I know you, you guys talk about quite a lot um but yeah and, and i write nonfiction, and i have my podcast the creative pen podcast um which is uh coming up to eight years now which is kind of crazy um and yeah I, i've the third edition of how to market a book has been a real eye-opener because you know you think you know stuff and then you start researching the latest um stuff and come up with with new ideas so um i write non-fiction to kind of embed what i learn and hope that it helps other people too well, I do like to give authors identity crises when I meet, meet them. That's always a goal. So <laughs> we're, we're glad to have you on the fantasy sci-fi and fantasy marketing show since you have admitted that uh, you like those demons and portals and things. Therefore, you are writing fantasy. Yeah, I know. And I do have demons in almost every single one of my books. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Well, before we jump into the questions on marketing, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you kind of decided to get into self-publishing? And I remember at one point you had an agent, so I'm curious what's kind of, do you just love the control? What's kept you self-publishing and, and experimenting with all the marketing and stuff? Sure. Well, I always ran one. Well, I didn't always, but I run a lot of businesses. So I um, was a business consultant in my previous life in large corporates. And so I started my own company sort of, you know, 20 years ago. Um, and I, you know, as an individual sole trader type of person. And then I I had a scuba diving company. I had a property investment company. And um, so when I decided to write a book back in 2006, I never really considered anything else except doing it myself because that's the kind of person I am and I basically at the time in 2006 2007 there was no international kindle there was no you know sort of kdp out there create space I don't think existed it was something else before then book surge I think it was called um so I printed books put them in my garage and then tried to sell them and I was living in Australia back then I actually think you and I connected probably online around 2009 Lindsay um, you know, when, when you started blogging and, and stuff. And so it was, I really made the decision from the beginning to self-publish. And then once I decided to write a novel, again, I didn't even consider it. So I eventually got an agent um, through going to Thriller Fest. So if people want agents, then going to author events can be really effective. And I'm actually going to Thriller Fest again next week. It's um, one of the festivals I go to, um, the conventions I go to. It's awesome in New York every year. And so I got, I got a New York agent, supposedly, the amazing thing um, and we did query some existing books around the time when a lot of um, indies were getting book deals um, but because <laughs> looking back now I kind of look at it and go yeah it was never gonna happen because my books were ca kind of Dan Brown meets Lara Croft plus demons and there, there wasn't really anything in the market for that at that point um, subsequently I've I've had so I split up with that agent and this is another thing that many authors don't know is that agents many authors will have multiple agents in their lifetime and splitting up with an agent is completely normal so since then I've actually had another agent um who I've also split up with 
<laughs> and I mean, it was funny talking with my last agent about this. Um, he's like, look, you're, you don't want to compromise on what you want to sell. And that makes it hard to sell. Like if you only want to sell foreign rights, that's not very interesting to an agent anymore. The, the big money is in English language. So, you know, I'm not anti-traditional publishing at all. And I'm actually considering it, you know, considering going down that route for the first time properly, like taking it quite seriously for marketing reasons, because as we know, you can't necessarily reach some of the places that you might want to as an indie. So it's something I'm considering, but um, as a control freak, like many of us, uh, I chose indie and I'm still a very happy indie author. Awesome. Yeah, I'm kind of the same way with uh, agents in traditional publishing. I would consider it, but I think I would have to write a project specifically with the idea in head that I'm going to submit this because I can't like give up a series that I've already started and it's already making money and I don't want to change anything. <laughs> so I'd be like, I would be a really bad uh, client, I guess. <laughs> and I think that's that's the thing. You have to think, okay, so yeah, I'm a bad client and how, so if I want to do this and be a good client, what would work? And I agree with you. So I'm looking at writing writing a trilogy um, that would fit, that I would be like with a new trilogy, no crossovers to my existing work with the thought that if I was going to pitch that project, also good for merchandise, good for film TV type thing, like really a good package that if it sold, you know, for whatever, it would be more like a, a separate project that wouldn't overlap with my indie work. Um, so yeah, and I, th I think, you know, I met some agents the other night, I was speaking at a a publishing thing in London and you know they were like look and I because I said have I done like damage in terms of what people think of me because my name is out there as an indie quite outspoken indie and they're like not at all um, agents and publishers are very interested in talking to successful indie authors and by successful um, they said you know someone who sold over 50,000 copies uh, within a reasonable amount of time on a book so if that is something that people are interested in then it definitely is still possible but you had kevin j anderson on last week right because uh, and he's awesome and he was you know he wasn't warning people off it but he was certainly saying if you get a traditional deal you still have to do the marketing so don't expect it to be some you know silver bullet that will you know solve all your marketing problems <laughs> Right. We've had quite a few guests on that are doing the hybrid thing. A lot of them have started out traditionally published and then started indie publishing on the side. And that really seems to be the best of both worlds because your books are in bookstores. But then there's these other books that you control and you're making more money on because people can come find you more easily that way. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, I thought I had thought, you know, like a year ago, OK, great. Well, like Hugh Howey, I, I could do just uh, foreign language deals, but um, we're not we don't all have Hugh Howey numbers um, or the Hugh Howey yacht. <laughs> so um, I think for many, you know, most most of those foreign rights deals come off the back of the English language deal and uh, that's how they get noticed. Now things are changing. So IPR license, which is an interesting model, um, just launched a, a button like a buy rights now button um, in the last couple of weeks, which I could see in maybe five years time that um, indies could put that on their websites and people could, you know, buy your the Spanish rights to your series or we've actually just had an email from Vietnam about the Vietnamese rights and I'm like, okay, we can definitely talk about the Vietnamese rights. I mean, that's not something I was expecting. So these things can happen, but you've got to think, okay, so maybe you can sell um, foreign rights for a couple of thousand dollars that's not huge that's not going to pay the bills for that long so you have to do a lot of those smaller deals to make it worthwhile and a lot of those deals is a lot of work so I think you know what we do as we become sort of um, more developed uh, in the business of being an author is we start outsourcing our work and I think that's the way to consider if you want to work with an agent or um, do foreign rights deals is to consider how do you work as a partner with an agent or foreign rights agents to to you know working together not just a sort of please take my book type of thing yeah was, that's actually one of my questions for later so i'll go ahead and ask now because we were talking about that ipr licensing site on the somewhere book show a couple of weeks ago and i was just wondering if you had checked it out and you know i see a lot of books on there but i'm like are agents actually or publishers in other countries are they finding this site and are they looking for 
books yet. Do you have any idea on that? Well, that that is exactly the problem. Uh, <laughs> and the main thing is that the the big they've signed a couple of big publishers who are putting their backlist on there. So um, let's say Hungarian language rights, for example, they don't want to spend the time as an agent negotiating those type of deals, which might be smaller. Um, so the bigger companies that put these buttons on, that's quite a good deal for what I think is happening with translation rights, um, two things. One is that um, as the revolution in indie and small press, because let's face it, a lot of indies are starting their own small presses, what's happening in this fragmentation of the bottom end of the curve as such where, where we are, you know, there's the big, big publishers and then there's lots and lots of smaller publishers. As that model moves out, as it has from America to you know UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and then into the other foreign language markets, like we're starting to see India, Germany, anywhere that Amazon is moving into, <laughs> that's the type of area to watch. So they bought Souk, um, Souk.com in the Middle East uh, in an attempt to take the Middle East into digital. Um, so if you think uh, that as there are groups like us appearing in different countries around the world, those size publishers and those size models are more likely to want to work with people like us on that smaller level. That is probably five to 10 years coming. The other thing that I think, given my futurist hat, you know, I love to put my futurist hat on. Um, I've actually got a book here called Technology in 2050, which I'm th you know, thinking about how, how things are changing, is that I think within the next, let's say 10 to, tw 10 to 20 years, or they're saying by 2027 to 2030, machines will be able to translate, the AI translation will be as good as, good as or better than human translation. So I'll want, you know, someone will want to read your book in Spanish, they'll just take their headset, their handset, whatever they're reading on, and they'll, you know, say, translate this, and they'll be able to read your book anyway. So I actually think that translation is going to go the way of um, vinyl, in that there'll be human artisan translators where it will be expensive to buy those beautifully translated books. And then there'll be the AI translated version, um, which with digital will completely radically change the translation market. So the question is, if you're going to sign, and this would probably be my recommendation, if you're going to sign foreign language rights, look at doing a 10 year license, because in 10 years, things may well be very different. All right, that's some awesome stuff to think about right there. I think people are going to get their money's worth on this show. We're only 10 minutes in, and I feel like I'm learning a lot. But uh, I do wonder with these robots if uh, how they'll work with humor, because that's something I always wonder about when I'm doing like plays on words, and I'm like, that's only going to work in English, where they rhyme or something like that, or that's the same. So I'm like, I do wonder about the translations and uh, <laughs> if the jokes just sorry, the Japanese version is just not going to have the same jokes. Well, I. I I think like I've, I've, I'm reading, um, I've just actually just finished a translated crime novel and there's some bits in it, you're reading it going, that is the wrong word. I mean, that is completely, un they kept using the word unctuous, that's it. The word unctuous is not a word we use normally in conversation and it's like four or five times in this book and I'm just like what is going on completely ridiculous occasions and I'm like this is crazy and this is like this well-renowned uh, translated so I think the point is that that's already happening um who knows whether that was humor or not possibly not as a dark crime book but it, I, I think that doesn't detract from a story so getting hung up on like little things I think is uh, won't stop the march of of the AI <laughs> Yeah. And I'm very positive about it. I just want to be clear. I am positive about the changes of technology. All right, cool. Well, I, I think it is something that will hopefully continue to improve uh, things on many levels and uh, b worth, be worth looking forward to. But uh, for those who are not quite there and not ready to sell their translation rights yet or, or have the AIs do the translating, let's kind of jump into your book a little bit and talk about some of the more basic stuff. Um, I do want to point out for anyone listening that your your book is super comprehensive. Uh, right now, there's a lot coming out on like how to do Amazon ads and how to do Facebook ads and things like that. And and that's awesome. You know, once you get to a certain level, that's what you want. But I think anyone that's a little newer or just wants a real good fundamentals, that this is a, a really good book. And And there is some advanced stuff in there. Like you've got a case study on how to hit the USA Today list. I think it was with ad stacking. So the, there's definitely a lot of good stuff in there. 
Um, but let me ask you, you were kind of talking about some of the polarities of marketing, as you call them in the book, and hmm. where you're talking about things like, what are you shooting for? You know, is branding more important or is income more important? Are you thinking short term versus long term? Could you just talk a little bit about some of the considerations authors have right now when it comes to that stuff? Yeah, sure. And this is kind of my my bugbear right now is that um, authors are always looking for this magic bullet, this one thing or this one new thing. Like you see people jumped on Facebook ads and then it was like, oh, that doesn't work quick. What's the next thing? Oh, it's Amazon ads. OK, well, now that's stopped working. What's the next thing? Uh, as if these individual things are going to be the thing that works. And what's interesting with the how to market a book and you don't have to do everything in the book. Right. But there's um, there's a lot of chapters on all the different things we do. Podcasting is a good example of something that, you know, I've been doing since 2009 uh, when nobody was listening. You guys remember when nobody listens to the show, right? At the beginning, nobody listens. Like it's, it's one of those things you invest time in and you see what happens. And over years, something may happen. So the polarities I are a way of framing all the different marketing stuff that's going on right now. So um, building a long-term audience with something like a podcast versus a short-term sales spike like hitting the USA Today, um, which uh, which I've been able to do by you know putting out a high price box set, reducing the price to 99 cents and doing a book bub. Now, those two things are completely different. And yet they both market our books and they both um, hopefully make us money over the long term. But equally, you know, which one is more important? It's good to say, yes, I hit the USA today. It's good that I sold like 10,000 books that week or something. But isn't my podcast a better asset for the long term? It's how people hear our voices every week. It's how people get to know what we're writing. It helps people. So when you're comparing these different marketing things it's really important to consider the each of these polarities on the list it's quite it's quite a long um uh, post but you know things like short term versus long term um paid or free those are two massive differences um then things like your own name or a pen name both of us write under our own names and pen names um you know stuff like um oh, I've, I've also put focused versus eclectic so there are people out there who are incredibly focused who know what they can do um th thinking of someone like um brian meeks with um uh, Amazon ads, you know, real data guy focusing in. Um, I'm just not like that. I'm an eclectic person. I like doing different things all the time and I don't like sitting down doing data. So that doesn't suit me. So what suits you? What suits your book? What are your goals? Um, you know, things like paid versus free. I spent the first five years building my author platform with free tools like podcasting is actually free. Um, Twitter is free. Um, blogging can be free. Lots of all these free things. But some authors overtook me with paid advertising. So which is more effective? These are the questions you have to consider. So whenever there's a new marketing thing, having a look through these type of polarities, and it's gonna go on the blog, so you don't have to buy the book, it will be on the blog <laughs> um, for free, uh, then it can help you work out where that sits on your own marketing schedule and whether or not you want to jump into it now or save it for later. Would you say that for most people, it's probably a good idea to have like maybe a combination of the like the short term and the long term going like maybe you've got a blog and a podcast. It's kind of an ongoing thing. But over here, you're going to try some Facebook ads. Yeah. And that's kind of the point. You do need an ecosystem. Uh, you know, all marketing is not one thing. You know, it's like thinking campaigns, not in individual um things so not, you don't just run one facebook ad and that's it um you don't just run one book bub and that's it you don't just write one book <laughs> um and you and i you know all of us um on the show know that writing more books is also important there's been a backlash against the write more books style of of marketing which i think is hilarious because if your goal is to make money, and of course not everyone's goal is to make money, and that's completely fine. If you understand that your goal isn't to make money, that's fine. But if it is, then you do have to look at, okay, so if I run, so I still have a perma-free first in series. Now, some people are saying that doesn't work, but I find that it does work um, for my books, and I've been doing it for years. It still helps build my list, um, and building the list is you know, the unsexy thing we all have to keep doing. So having a combination of both of these different um, angles, the short term and the long term, paid versus free, all these different things, 
will build your ecosystem over time. But what is the point of building an ecosystem if you're only going to write one book? So uh, I think it all comes back to that uh, in the end. Yeah, if you're planning to have a career as an author, you definitely have to have some of those long term plans that you're continually feeding, I guess, like your podcast. And as far as the write more books thing, I think that's just kind of another way of marketing in itself. Mm -hmm. For some of us that don't like doing as much of the, you know, being out here trying to sell my book, planning and organizing newsletter swaps and all this stuff, <laughs> just putting a book out, you know, that's kind of one of the great forms of marketing. And it really suits some of us that don't like the, a lot of the other stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what it comes back to in the end is what what can you do for the long term? So I really like my podcast. Um, you know, I like doing it. I like connecting with people. If I didn't do that, I'd probably never speak to any anyone else. <laughs> um, I, I've liked Twitter for years. I don't particularly like Facebook. You know, I use it as because I need it for an ad platform. But even then, I use it very sparingly. So again, you have to think about who you are. Like, you know, if you're an introvert, and that what's great about all of this type of stuff is you can schedule it. Now, you, this is live, but like I schedule my podcast sometimes weeks in advance um, in order to have time off the internet. Um, so, you know, I think you can manage your writing and your marketing life according to how you like to live. Um, and that's super important because why would we do this if you're just creating ourselves another job? Definitely. I've heard the term lifestyle entrepreneur as a, a type for some people, and that's definitely me. <laughs> do enough to have the life I want to live. All right, let me ask one more question. The poor guys are going to fall asleep over there because I'm not letting them talk. But <laughs> I love chatting with you, Joanna. So I have all these questions for you. But uh, you mentioned the pen name. So let me just ask, you know, I think a lot of people are kind of wondering if you do do a pen name for whatever reasons, do you need to have a list and a website and a social media presence for each name? Or is it better to do it with one and just kind of, I don't know, I have a couple, I have a different list for my pen name and a website that I hardly ever update. And she's finally got a Facebook page, but I don't do as much because it's hard to keep two of them going. Yeah, and I have three now, which is ridiculous. Um, so yeah, first of all, it is really hard, but I have two active brands, Joanna Penn and JF Penn, both of which have my face on, my name on and everything. And then the Sweet Romance, which I'm co-writing with my mom, and I wouldn't have done otherwise. So just to be clear, you know, I write dark books, but these books are Sweet Romance, they're all lovely. And that's because it's my mom. And for that, my mom's 70. She is not interested in the internet. She's not interested in marketing and I'm too busy with my other two brands. So I'm not going to do um, th that at all. So what we've done with that brand, um, it's completely on its own. We have, the books are on KDP Select, so we're not even going wide as yet. Um, then we have an, an email list sign up in the back, but we don't have a giveaway on the website. So I'm not, I don't have a list builder. I don't have a perma free. We just have a static website with a sign up if you'd like to know when the next book is out. And that way we've built up a list of 25 people in two months, which I do think is pretty good. Um, but it's weird starting again um, for me. Um, and then we have a Facebook page where Essentially, I got my VA to schedule six months worth of images, posting one a day, <laughs> and in order that we can use that for advertising. So in the book, I go through the different ways I launch each of my books under each of my brands. So um, how to market a book? I asked you, can I come on the show? And I'll talk about it on my podcast and I'll do all kinds of things because Joanna Penn does all kinds of things. But for the sweet romance, um, it literally is put it on KDP Select, put the first book on, you know, five days free, get a free booksy um, and do some ads uh, on Facebook. And that's pretty much it. So and then it's like, OK, write the next book, mom. <laughs> so it's it's really interesting to be worked to kind of be starting again with a new name in a new ecosystem where I built my online platform for nonfiction before writing fiction and, and already had some people around. So wherever you are now, you can do this without doing tons of stuff. Um, obviously, it, in a year's time when we have maybe seven or eight books under the romance pen name, I'll probably put one to perma free, I'll probably do a list sign up. So you can do these things over time. Don't think that on day one, if you're new, that you have to do everything on day one, or that you have to do everything per pen name that you're writing in. Um, you can just see how it goes. 
Awesome advice. And, and I would say too, in some of the niches, if you happen to be maybe in a little less competitive one, it's possible, totally possible to kind of have your books take off or at least do really well without a lot of outside advertising and marketing. I think a lot of this stuff is when that doesn't happen for people, then they, you know, okay, well, I got to figure it out. I got to sell some books. So maybe you'll get lucky. You know, maybe you have to work a little harder. You never know. All right, let me let, let the guys ask some questions. And we have a couple people watching that have asked questions too. So I'll let you guys ask those. Yep. Um, all right. So my, my first question is um, a lot of marketing, particularly in sci fi and fantasy, focuses on series. You're talking about in a year when you have seven books. Uh, let's, let's say for the person who has one book that they just finished, is it better to sort of release that book uh, and give it the big promotional push that you can? or to sort of hold back until the second plan book is released so that you have you know the two books and you can lean on the first and like that. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, uh, as we all hate the advice, but um, I think it was Liliana Hart who originally came up with this. And I remember a blog post Hugh Howie did on it. It was like five years ago. Um, he called it the Liliana Nirvana technique, um, which was five, five ready to go and one ready to put up. And it was like, seriously, five? And what was funny with this sweet romance, I did say to my mom, look, mom, you're going to write three books and then we'll publish them all together. And then when she'd finished the first one, she was like, can we please put it out now? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, okay, let's just put it out. And, and, but not worry too much about it. And I think this is the big point is that one book, unless it's okay, let's say it, well, when they were talking science fiction and fantasy, unless you have an audience already. So I interviewed a guy on my blog ages ago who'd done a web comic. So he had an audience from his web comic and then he'd written a book. So he had an audience ready to go, um, but most people don't. And if you don't have an audience, I think the, the reality is that it's very hard to sell one book. Um, what's so weird about the traditional publishing industry is that they put so much emphasis on debut authors when often there's only one book and that's I, I still can't quite get that because obviously or any marketing you do for your first in series or for your series there will you know you will sell more books if there are more books so I would say yeah I mean I'll also be very frank about it the sweet romance author is in um, in the red as in we've already spent more money on it than we've earned and we've got two books up so far um, So, you know, that's the reality of running a business Nobody starts a business and makes a profit on day one So you have to decide like with this author name. It's a it's a brand name and uh, you know I'm fully intending it to run on even later on <laughs> if my mum decides she doesn't want to do it anymore so you, if you're going to invest in an author brand, you have to be looking at spending some money up front to start getting some traction somehow. Even something like a free booksy is going to cost you, what, 70 bucks, I think, something like that. Um, and you can get some cheaper stuff, but you're going to have to spend some money. So if you only have one book, you're unlikely to make it back. Whereas if you have three books, you're going to make it back. So it depends on your personality and what your goal is. But if you can wait awesome i never have been able to wait <laughs> yeah i am marked by impatience as well yeah. i heard someone say on the subject of like having to put in money uh whenever you start a new enterprise you should expect to put a lot into it before you're able to take any out of it uh, yeah the... and, and that's true of any business this is the thing and i actually put a, a graph on my blog at the end of last year because it's now been 10 years since i started doing this and um, the first year you know it was all below the line and then it was slightly less below the line and then it was kind of towards the line and then it was like 12 grand over the line and and then th and the years have gone have gone up and you know i'm very happy now at, you know at this point that i'm earning far more than i did in a day job but it took eight years to cross that line to, to earning more than I used to. So I think the the myth of the sort of put one book out and you'll be able to leave your job. Uh, I, I don't know if that's ever been true for, for anyone. Yeah, the only the only thing you can ever leave a job for is another job. So just keep in mind, <laughs> this book is going to have to be a job. That's um, a very good point. <laughs> yeah. um, so there's, um, speaking of putting money into something, we only have so much time or money for, to devote to marketing. When you're planning a book release, like how long before that book release and how long after the book releases should we be aggressively promoting? <sighs> 
it's, it's again it's going to be different per situation because what i like to do and this is i i, I prefer the because um, i'm british i prefer the authentic not hard marketing type thing so what i love about having a podcast for example is at the beginning of every show i'll talk about what i'm writing so i've been talking about this map series um fiction that i've been pretty much talking about since january and I've only, you know, I've got about 30,000 words or something, fantasy series. Um, and the thing is, I'm talking about it now. Who knows? Someone might listen to this in six months time and they might go, oh, that sounds interesting. And they might go check out my author page and go, maybe that book will be out by then. And they buy the book. Now, that book is now. I'm still writing it. Who knows what will happen? But I'm talking about it now. So this come, it's not just um, show your work by Austin Cleon, but he talks about that. It's like share your journey. And in that way, people will possibly be ready to buy so that you know how to market a book the third edition i've been talking about writing it for a couple of months i've been sharing pictures and been talking about my writing process all along the way and then there'll be an email i'll be doing a facebook ad um and then it will go on my website now i've got quite a lot of books now so it's not so urgent but everything i think you've got to think about marketing as this ecosystem so everything you do is bringing people back to your hub and on your hub you have these different products so you know i share pictures of graveyards quite a lot because i love graveyards <laughs> and um uh, like when Lindsay and i went to the museum of death in new orleans you know we took pictures and we shared those or even one when we went out on an airboat right it, that's just a glimpse into the life of an author <laughs> traveling exciting travels and that in another way brings people to your book so there there are no rules around this amount of time beforehand and this amount of time afterwards it's more about um incorporating your marketing into your life so for example if you hate marketing put one picture a day on instagram of stuff you like and in a year you'll be surprised but you'll actually have a small audience <laughs> yeah that makes a lot of sense and it's i i have to say like uh you never want to see the whole buy my book on mm. social media but if you're just constantly providing interesting information then people are interested in what you're saying and sometimes what you're saying is buy my book i think it's sort of the a constant back burner version of promotion is probably an interesting and uh non-invasive way of doing it yeah and, and i think i think that's really important and it's also to be kind of top of mind so i've been trying to like audiobooks are a good example it's very hard to market audiobooks but by trying to make it clear that the audiobooks are available just by bringing it into conversation now and then um you know while talking about other things <laughs> and um y y people when they're like oh i've got my audible credit what should i buy this month oh i could buy you know the successful author mindset on Aud audible um or whatever and that, you know, by you, say, sharing pictures of, um, uh, what is your Book of Deacon stuff, you know, pictures from the thing, people are like, oh, you know, I, what's that thing? You know, I need a new book. Maybe I'll just go look at that website or whatever. So you, you, that to me is what the mar marketing is more about. It's this, it is this brand building, this top of mind type thing. Um, and apparently the International Thriller Writers did a survey. It takes three and a half books before, so between three and four books for, an, for a reader to actually remember your name. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's an uphill struggle. <laughs> um, all right, so one more question. Um, we, we sort of covered it, but uh, like, is it better to devote your marketing resources to your latest work? Or again, we, we talk about constant low grade background stuff. Like how much should you be thinking about your backlist when you're thinking about marketing? I think um, the money is in the backlist as such. Um, so I, I, and I think it's all about, just trying to weave things into situations so for example i'm just doing a blog post on anatomical museums um <laughs> which may seem a little niche but my um my book desecration which um opens with a body in the hunterian museum which is a famous anatomical museum in london now if you're into anatomy and body parts in jars like me then um this is a, a series uh, there's three books and i wrote them like three three years ago whatever um then i'm you know this is an article that is related to older books that i'm going to put out there um i use meet edgar to do my social media it's an interesting article i'll do some Facebook ads on it, it'll get and then do retargeting on those old books because it's actually easier <laughs> to market a a box set um 
and audiobooks just you know little tip on fiction audio it needs to be longer so my that box set for audio sells really well compared to the individual books so I know that if I can get traffic on that box set then I will make sales so I'm constantly thinking that way and like the USA Today I hit the USA Today with books that were over five years old uh, because it's much easier to market books with reviews on. <laughs> it's really hard to market a book with no reviews. So uh, it is always easier to market backlist and a book is new to whoever has just found it. Um, again, the traditional publishing has this uh, you know, obsession with brand new books, um, but I think we should always be considering our older work as well. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, the thing I think about with that is uh, uh, the Bohe Bohemian Rhapsody hit number one on the on the best uh, on the Billboard lists twice, and they were in separated by ten years. Like this is a thing, like because it sh shows up in a movie, and now everyone's buying it again. So yeah, the backlist is certainly a thing you should focus on. And I have one more thing to say before I hand you off to Jeff, and that is I use the word unctuous uh, uh, conversationally. I described the <laughs> burger as being unctuous the other day. <laughs> and my friend of mine said it was an oddly appetizing word. So. It, it is, but you used it for a burger. This was about like a dead body. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's... It was used in a really wrong context. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's what I got for this section. So on to Jeff. Oh, choice burger. Really? <laughs> the cheese was all melty and delicious. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. Uh, Mike, I've got a couple of questions that have already been uh, answered here. So my, my first question for you is, in your book, How to Market a Book, Third Edition, you state that many authors will focus on short-term sales spikes rather than consider long-term marketing. Can you explain to us what you mean by that? Yeah, so I think there's there's often this focus on where where am I where's my book in the charts and this uh, comparisonitis is a huge issue in the author community um, and this is something that you know I I'm I think when you only have a book or two uh, you can you can get obsessed with where you are in the charts and even perhaps you know as as you go along like when you have a new book launch it is good to know where you are in the charts and stuff but the obsession with immediate sales can prevent that longer term uh, focus because we only have a certain number of hours in the day so I have on my desk um, I read mainly on Kindle but I have some print books to kind of remind myself of things and I have Deep Work by Cal Newport on my desk now it's a great book I highly recommend people get that um, I have it in audio and ebook and print because it's so important because if you if you're always focusing on short-term sales spikes and short-term rankings you won't have time to do your deep work which is create the next book um, and I like the Asimov you know Isaac Asimov's kind of model which is he wrote over 400 books in his lifetime only about three of them are actually famous <laughs> um, and you know that kind of model of well what do you want to spend your time doing do you want to create what may well be the best book you've ever written or do you want to spend your time constantly watching your ranking now as someone who you know I, I do make good money with my books but I'm not obsessed with ranking also we've got to remember that places like iBooks and Kobo and actually nine percent of my book sales last year were direct sales from my website those aren't counted anywhere and I make 95 percent royalty on direct sales <laughs> I mean that's pretty amazing that's better than a lot of publishers <laughs> like big name publishers so I think what we what we need to come back to is a bigger question what do I want to cheat to achieve with my body of work over my lifetime, <laughs> which is a much longer term focus than getting up into the Amazon top 100 um, this week. Now, and then have these short term spikes in specific periods. So when I decided I wanted to hit the USA Today, it was, okay, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna focus really hard for this amount of time, this one particular week, go really hard, and then, um, and then forget about it again. <laughs> so that would be my recommendation is generally focus on that deep work model that long-term marketing model where you're putting things in place for the longer term thinking in series doing box sets um put in you know whatever it is you're going to do long term and then do short-term spikes when you have a specific launch but don't spend your time obsessing over comparisonitis because you know elizabeth gilbert in um 
big magic, you know, to, she wrote Eat, Pray, Love, if people don't remember, um, you know, when she wrote that book and she became multi-billionaire, you know, people said to her, so what are you going to do now you've written the best book of your life? <laughs> and, and she was like, well, I'm going to go and write another book, <laughs> you know, because that's what we do. Uh, so I think, yeah, it's just about what's, what's important for the longer term. Yes, guess if you're going to ask a question, make sure you're not still muted. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's, that's that's definitely good to know. I, I mean, I, it sounds like I would say a good 99.9% .9 of us focus on the short-term spikes. I'd rather than even think about long-term sales. I mean, I'm, I was one of them when I first started all this, I will admit. All right, I have a listener question for you that actually is going to jump back to the foreign translation bit. He said, let's see here, we have a question. He has a question about the Netherlands. He wanted to know if you knew anything about a website called Bol, B O L dot D E, and wondering how it pertains. He said he said it heard he's heard it's Bertelsmann, one of the big five publishers, and they're like the quote unquote Amazon of the Netherlands. Do you know anything about them and possibly how to get on there? I think Kobe Plus goes to Bol. Um, maybe someone can check that out. But um, yeah, it looks it looks like you can get onto a bowl through Kobo Plus. So if you publish direct on Kobo Writing Life, you can turn on Kobo Plus, um, which is like um, KDP Select, except. No, it's like Kindle Unlimited because it's um, no. In fact, it's not like it at all because it's non-exclusive. <laughs> so um, it's basically Kindle's um, subscription program for the for Kobo subscription program for the Netherlands. I'm screwing this up completely. Um, basically, if you publish direct on Kobo Writing Life, you can get into Bowl. You can get into a lot of other um, stuff in the Netherlands, um, which is a uh, you know uh, English speaking, very English speaking market. I mean, you know the Dutch speak amazing English and read a lot in English so it is a market to um, to look at if you're interested you can um, advertise there obviously um, oh look uh, Smashwords delivers there too um, Joe said so yeah basically you can you can get there but remember the Netherlands right now I mean it's not a hugely digital market it's still um, most of Europe is still print dominated um, you know Germany's probably the forerunner of of digital in in Europe but I think it will happen over the next couple of years and certainly the Netherlands is um, is pretty interesting uh, yeah there are some interesting things happening yeah, I was just going to mention, yeah, Joe mentioned it too. It's like, okay, I've, I've, the only thing I've ever dealt with with Smashwords is let them handle everything. And I just did a quick search for my name and up popped some of my books. I'm like, ah, they must somehow talk to Smashwords because <laughs> I, I'm there. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Is that, is that, he has an additional question that says, let's see, does she have any ideas about market research and finding other authors in a similar category? She's mentioned using Facebook ads by targeting Dan Brown, but what about those of us who don't have a big name? Yeah, you you generally do your market research on Amazon. I mean, we love Kobo, we love iBooks, we love everyone else, but you spend your time on Amazon. You look at the books you read, you look at the authors who are charting there. Um, I mean, I think uh, Chris Fox's Six Figure Author is a really good book um, about that. Um, or, you you know, I, I don't personally write to market, um, but the book Write to Market has stuff on how to do that too. But essentially, you know, you you are looking into categories, um, you know, go down the left hand side of Amazon and look at the authors who are selling there. And actually, Facebook ads are a p bit of a pain because you can only target um, bigger names. Uh, I was thrilled to find that you can now target me as the creative pen on Facebook. <laughs> you can't target me as JF pen, but you can target pretty much every author on Amazon ads. So if you do want to do that type of targeting, you can target the tiniest indie authors on by using Amazon ads um, and the tiniest keywords. So I would definitely, you know, you do your market research where you read in the genre you read and the genre you write. All right, very cool. Courtney, I hope that uh, asked, answered your questions there for you. That's it for me. Let, me. let me hand you back over to Lindsay. We can get going on the next section. All right, cool. And I'll just chime in on that really quickly, too, because of my pen name, which I've talked about on here before. I do science fiction romance, and traditional publishing barely touches it. There are some authors out there, and they're all too small to have a Facebook to target on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And so I've just found that I don't really do Facebook ads beyond a couple boosted posts for the pen name. But like Joanna was saying, you can. I just went through the top 100 on sci fi romance and grabbed all the authors, and then all the authors that were linked in there you know, also bots and stuff to feed into Amazon ads and also into the BookBub PPC ads. You can do it by author like that. 
So that's, you may just find that in some platforms are not going to work as well, maybe in the real small niches like that. All right, we kind of jumped around earlier and already talked about translations and foreign rights. So I really only have uh, one question and then a, a couple of listener questions I'll go ahead and ask for you uh, in regard to like selling internationally. Uh, I was saying I recently did the BookBub PPC ads, which lets you specifically advertise to like Amazon UK, India, Australia, Canada. I think you can do Kobo also uh, with the pen name. I'm just in Amazon, so I wasn't able to check that out. But it was cool that I could get clicks from Amazon India from my BookBub ads. But that's kind of the, that and maybe Facebook. I know you can target different countries. That's about it for um, international sales, specifically trying to target countries. Do you have any tips for if I want to sell more books in New Zealand or India or Australia, uh, what kind of things would you recommend doing? Well, if you have a platform like we do, um, I don't know, have you guys done the stats on your podcast countries? Joe, do you ever look at that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't look at the countries. I, I sometimes look at the raw numbers, but I haven't sliced it up in that uh, granularity. Yeah, see, that's something to do because my podcast, for example, um, I think it's 55 countries listen to my podcast. 15% of my podcast listeners are in China. Now, that's a real surprise, right? I mean, who knew? Um, Twitter, I schedule my posts in multiple time zones. So I am not tweeting 24 seven, but I'm scheduling in multiple time zones, um, you know, so that people will click through at different times. Um, with your, and that's, I've done that since the beginning. So when I first started um, with the blog and the podcast uh, uh, and my books, I was living in Australia and deliberately targeted the American time zones, um, which is why I think still a lot of people think I'm American until they hear me talk. <laughs> But, um, you know, so you can you can be when you're doing things, always be thinking about where people are at the in the world at a particular time and schedule stuff so um, they can access it, too. Even things as basic as make sure your books are available globally. I mean, this is something I lecture to traditionally published authors all the time. They're like, oh, yeah, I signed a contract. I'm like, well, what's that contract for? And they're like, oh, uh don't know. And I'm like, yeah, well, if it's US Canada, for example, you could self publish in Britain, you could self publish in the rest of the world and still make money that way. So even just having stuff available. But what we've got to remember is it's the internet. <laughs> There are people searching the internet from all over the world. So anything you do online, um, like Facebook is massive in India. Um, Instagram, you know, put if you're putting pictures on Instagram with small, you know, tag words or whatever, um, <laughs> terrible um, hashtags, let's say, um, then, um, you know, people can see pictures. Pictures span other cultures, other languages. And in fact, your pictures from Arizona or New Jersey or whatever, I can't remember where you all are, but that might not be interesting to you or to many Americans, but it sure is interesting to someone who's living in Rwanda. Like I've got a, um, a reader in Rwanda who really loves my books, you know, or different places around the world. So when you're thinking about marketing, yes, doing things like um, BookBub and paid ads and stuff like that, that's awesome. If you're direct on Kobo Writing Life, they often have promotions that are in different countries. So uh, there's a UK summer one that Americans can apply for, for example. Um, you know, they have different ones all the time. Going on podcasts. Uh, so instead of just searching for podcasts that are big in America, you could search for podcasts in Australia or the UK. Um, YouTube channels. Um, I was on a, a great uh, YouTube channel in, in in the deep south in America, uh, which I really enjoyed. And it was very culturally different to what I was expecting. Um, so, you know, these are the things to think is, OK, so I've written a fantasy book about um, dragons. Maybe I should uh, contact some Welsh podcasts because the dragon is the symbol of Wales here in the United Kingdom. So start thinking like outside the box in terms of um, what type of marketing, you know, what marketing is. It's not just, you know, must do paid blast to this specific country. There are lots and lots of, of other ways. For example, I, intervie I interviewed some Indian um, podcasters on my blog, um, have, uh, you know, traveled there and, and talked to people. And, you know, obviously not everyone can do these things, but just start thinking a bit 
more broadly about what time people are doing things, what they're interested in and how you could reach them and start doing some Google searches for who you might reach out to in those areas. All right, cool. Good advice. And, uh, you know, I really like the tip of the time zones. That's something super easy to implement. Not that I do it, but, uh, you know, there's people that read in English books in every single time zone in the world. And, you know, I remember when I was in the army and I was in Korea, it was a really weird time zone because you were, everybody was sleeping when you were up kind of thing. But uh, I would have loved some tweets. Not that we had Twitter back then. But uh, <laughs> All right. Let me ask. Uh, Benjamin was curious about your marketing plan for the map book. S is it substantially different than your thrillers since you're kind of in a different genre? Well, I haven't written it yet. So <laughs> I, I mean, I'm um, a discovery writer, as, as Lindsay found out in, um, in New Orleans, much to her, uh, her upset. <laughs> she was like, what? What? There isn't a really detailed thing of what's going Where's on. Where's the outline, Joanna? We have to have an outline. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what's going to happen until I sit down and write it. So the thing is with the map book, me talking about, I'm not even saying anything more than that at the moment, um, except that it opens in Bath where I'm living right now because I'm very um, impacted by where I live. And so I've started to talk about it. And I've started to, on Pinterest, this is, I, I do pictures on Pinterest, which again is, is not language specific um, or country specific. So I'm sharing pictures from my research. So there's quite a lot of cartographical um, maps and compass roses. And I found a tattoo of a woman with a full, the whole globe like on her back, it's just gorgeous. So, and I love tattoos. So I'm always sharing pictures of tattoos. So people who are interested in the things I'm sharing on Twitter or, or um, on my Facebook page for JF Penn author, or you know, are following my Pinterest, they might be clicking and liking, and it might go in their head, and they might hear it again in three months or whatever. So the marketing I'm doing right now is very gentle um, awareness marketing, I suppose, um, and I'm talking about it, but I'm not giving away any story ideas because I don't really know what's happening. I was dictating earlier, and I was like, whoa, where did that come from? <laughs> <laughs> that, that wasn't meant to happen. Um, so that I'm, I'm not actively planning that right now. Um, but yeah, I mean, I won't do anything different to what I normally do, which is I email my list. I do some ads. I talk about it on the podcast. I, I am doing a lot more content marketing on jfpen.com now. The reason being is when I looked at the most successful things that I've done as an author for the last, um, since 2008, so nine years on the creativepen.com, the biggest impact has been content marketing. Uh, in terms of building a brand and selling books. So I was like, well, it's worked so well for the creative pen, I should do it for JF Pen. So I'm starting to do content articles around, like I mentioned, the anatomical museums thing. I did a post on um, 15 cool things uh, to see in New Orleans, which had pictures of our, our trip um, and linked to American demon hunters. So I'm starting to use those types of marketing things to build my audience. And remember, you know, just a more of an, an advanced tip perhaps, if you get traffic to your page and you have a Facebook pixel, um, if they sign up for your list, then awesome. But also if they're on your pixel, you can retarget them with ads. So getting people onto your website is a really good idea if you have an active um, website like I do in general. So those are, are some ideas, but um, yeah, essentially it's a, it's a slow burn. Yeah, one of the nice things about the content marketing like you were talking about earlier, short versus long term, is that you can have the search engines, you know, the more popular your site becomes, you'll find people stumble onto posts you did like five years ago. And I'll have somebody tweet, retweet something on Twitter. I'm like, what? I don't even remember writing that. What, what is this? And I'm like, yeah. oh, it's from 2010. <laughs> yeah. And that's a really good point, which is why I'm focusing on evergreen material. So for example, I had one on religious relics, a cool religious relics from around the world. That is not a post that will go out of date anytime soon. <laughs> So yeah, putting things that are interesting to your target audience. Um, I still think, you know, I used to say that I didn't think content marketing worked for fiction, but now I'm pretty much, I think that it doesn't work for short term sales. What it does work for is that long term brand building um, around uh, your name and your website. And at the end of the day, you know, if you want, I, I also think we have to think 10 years, 20 years, however many years in the future, you know, Jeff Bezos himself said that Amazon will be disrupted. 
he hopes that it won't happen in his lifetime, but he's actually, what, 20 years older than all of us? And we don't know how much they're going to change the rules over time. So what I'm trying to do is, you know, we are independent. That is the definition of what we do. So be independent. Do not be dependent on one retailer, one country, one book, one series. Make sure you've you've built your multiple streams of income and your multiple, in, you know, the, the ways people can find you, all those little breadcrumbs all over the Internet. Definitely. And then just to totally jump off to a different topic here, I'll ask one more question. This is from Kay and he's noticed, I think it's he, I'm not sure. Sorry, Kay. <laughs> and uh, on Etsy, I guess he's active on Etsy or she, and that if they update, well, I'll just read it here. Uh, despite <laughs> on Etsy, despite the default search being classified as relevancy, they will put new items or items with recent changes to the tags or categories price on the first page of a search. So items with more recent changes get preference over more relevant but older items without changes. Uh, since Etsy is a competitor, competitor for Amazon, it would make sense that these two stores have similar search algorithms. Uh, also from previous episodes, he's heard authors talk about selling more after tweaking their categories, keywords, and blurbs. So his question is, do you think it's possible to maintain a high rank on Amazon and maintain visibility by editing your book each day after you start hitting the cliffs? Uh, even if it's just deleting a keyword one day and entering the same keyword the next day, what do you think? I think if you've got time to do that, then, you know, go for it and post some results of your tests uh, on keyboards or on a blog or whatever. Um, that's the type of thing that is interesting to you, like hardcore data marketers, which was one of coming back to the polarities. That's something that I talked about in that, you know, another thing that's different. Some people are data obsessed and some people are not so much <laughs> like me and you, Lindsay, I don't know about the guys, but it's, um, you know, it, I don't know. And none of us know. I don't even, the, the thing with machine learning, which Amazon has a lot of these days is I don't think anyone knows what, what the machine knows anymore. And, and there will be lots of things going on that we don't know. And even if you're right for a couple of days or a couple of weeks, chances are you won't be right, uh, you know, a month later when they change the rules. So, my personal opinion is I'm not going to spend my time doing that. Sure, I change my keywords and my blurbs and my categories every, well, I used to have a look at them every six months. And when I was re redoing this, I actually did a lot of my nonfiction categories because I hadn't actually touched them for about four years. <laughs> so I went in and did all that. And there are a lot more subcategories for nonfiction than there used to be. So I went in and refreshed that. So yes, you should do that. But I wouldn't suggest doing it every day. I would suggest spending that time like writing something. <laughs> I will say just to add to that, um, I used to be, I remember like a few years ago on Amazon, I, I kind of worked things so I could come up real high on the steampunk searches. And in my case, it really didn't affect sales at all. Uh, I did get up there. I got up in the first couple of results and it, you know, it probably depends. I think with nonfiction, people would be more likely to search for keywords right in the search box. Mm -hmm. And I, we have had authors who said they tweaked their keywords and, and got more organic sales that way. So you could definitely check it out. I, I don't know if just changing a keyword every day or anything would make a difference. I, I suspect Amazon's a little more sophisticated than Etsy would just be my guess since I've been doing this for 20 years. And, you know, it's, they make a lot of money just based on delivering the good results but you could certainly try it and see if it does make a difference kind of how you rank for your keyword when you search for it. You never know. All right, let me let the guys ask a few more and we're already up on an hour. I hope you're okay with doing a few more minutes. We, yeah, you yeah, it's okay. Awesome, you've got so much good information for us all. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, I'll say, just to add to the last remark, I feel like moving, uh, changing your keywords with incredible speed is very hard to determine whether or not it's actually helping because it's just like, it's very unscientific. You're, you're changing your variable very quickly. So that could just correlate to some other thing that's helping you out at some point. But uh, we talked a bit about translation already. I have a couple, couple of, my questions mostly deal with uh, translation and foreign rights. Uh, it's almost, I don't want to say it's almost impossible. It is exceptionally difficult to do a, a, a translation of your book like on your own. Like doing your own audiobook is easy because of ACX, and doing your own ebook is easy because of KDP. But like doing your own translation is it's tricky. And uh, so would you, like, would you say 
there's value in trying to do your own translation or is there value in searching for a small foreign press to give translation rights to or should you just dedicate your time to marketing the English language version of your book in non-English markets? I presume you mean by translating it yourself, finding a translator. That's what I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, if you don't speak German, <laughs> don't even try. <laughs> Do know? not use Google Translate, no, people. bad idea. <laughs> um, so I, try, I tried this a couple of years ago. There were a few authors doing well in Germany with German books. And so I did German, French, Italian, and Spanish. And basically, I um, found freelance translators who had done good books with other um, people. And we agreed on a royalty share, so um, collaboration, where they would help with the marketing in different languages and we would split the royalties. Now, I have basically folded all of that. Um, I I I paid the translators off in the end because we li I, I I lost money on it and ended up making like three euros in a year. <laughs> I mean it was it was dire. And here's why. Okay, if someone comes to any of us and says, "Oh, my book's not selling," um, the first question you ask is, "How many books do you have?" Um, that's pretty much what we say. And then we say, oh, you only have one book. Well, you're never going to make much money if you only have one book. Why don't you write some more books in that series? I mean, that's like one of the things we say. And I had one book on each of those, um, in those countries in that language. So I had one Spanish, one German, you know. So essentially that was never going to work. It may well have worked if I had had more books in the series and if I was able to do promotion. The second reason it didn't work is because of the maturity of the digital market in most of the rest of the non-English language speaking world. Um, there's a lot of legislation in somewhere like France and many other European countries to stop Amazon's digital overlordness. <laughs> um, you know, the, they're trying, like in France, they actually banned um, free shipping. So Amazon came back with one cent shipping. <laughs> Um, but there's actually legislation to stop some of these digital technologies. France particularly has, you know, protect our literature, protect our print market. So what we're looking at is a lot of countries um, that are protecting their existing market from digital. So if you look at, um, well, souk.com, Amazon buying souk.com is really interesting because I think they said 1% of the whole of the Middle East is buying online. That's tiny compared to what I think in America in some markets is about 50%, right? Um, so it's, it's just crazy. So those are two big reasons, only having one book and two just lack of a digital market where we have a level, level playing field. So again, that's why I think in five years time, 10 years time, things will be very different um, in that the march of, of digital will continue and that things will change. And the millennials and the whatever the uh, people are the millennials are <laughs> will shift the behavior of the buying public away from many of, of those controlling it right now. Um, so I think what you should do is focus on writing in English and um, have a website with your books on. And, you know, if you if things happen for you, then people will contact you and try and buy your rights. So that's one thing. You can also, um, it's very easy to find the publishers who publish different books. So say if you want to find who published Game of Thrones in Poland, just Google it and then you could always pitch if your book is like Game of Thrones, pitch that publisher. Th places like Poland, um, you know, other countries in the world have less of a hierarchy when it comes to agents and publishers because they're smaller markets. So you don't have to get an agent in Poland to pitch a Polish publisher. <laughs> Try saying that after two gins. <laughs> Um, so I think, yeah, those, um, but again, we looked at this earlier this year, um, and we set up curluppress.com as a sort of small press in order to start selling foreign rights. And we looked at the return on investment with our time. So let's take Poland. So say you license your books to Poland for 10 years and you get $2,000. Awesome. But how much work do you have to do to get that one deal? Whereas if you like, okay, I want to make $2,000, what's the better way of making that $2,000? Um, I decided in the end that I would rather focus on creating more books in English language. 
And actually in, in How to Market a Book, I have a chapter on strategy. And this is very, very important for authors to think about. Strategy is not just what you do, it's also what you don't do. <laughs> and there is, if you listen to all of these podcasts and try to do everything, you would get nowhere, right? Because there's just so much advice. Um, so the thing is, is to decide what you don't want to spend your time on. And I decided, look, I'm just not going to spend my time on chasing things that are not a big enough return. I'm going to focus on writing. Yeah, I think I think that makes a lot of sense. And I just to support your point about having more books is probably the same for other countries as it is for here. I've had a degree of success in Germany and well I've I've only sold foreign rights for for translation twice. And in both cases they bought three books at a time. Yeah. So it it uh, it certainly wasn't it was, it was you know it was a help. It would probably would have helped a little bit more if they had released all three books at the same time, but they released them in a fairly rapid succession. So it was still uh, yeah. not, well. Not I, I, I should say the most successful um, thing that has happened um, with my foreign stuff is working with a French indie author, um, Cyril Godefroy, who basically translated um, my nonfiction and has a platform and a I think he has a podcast in French on self-publishing. So we were a really good fit. As oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, so his his markets he's writing in French and he's translated my books into French and doing it that way and that works well for both of us. So that's an, a way of um, potentially doing it is is like I said near the beginning of the show, kind of connecting with other authors in other countries and figuring out um, other ways of doing things. What I will say is an author on my show this week, um, Sean Black, actually has made money through Babel Cube. So we should mention Babel Cube. Um, just Google that. Um, that that is a royalty split deal with translators and they they are the publisher um through their site and they t obviously take a cut so they're kind of like a smash words model with translation and collaboration um and he's the first person i've ever heard of who's actually making money through babel cube but hey you know if it's working and you know it's working for some people yeah, it's funny. I, I started off by saying there's no ACX or anything like it, but apparently there's a thing <laughs> like ACX for it. Uh, all right, so I have just one more question, and uh, I don't know if you'll have any insight into it, but it was floating through my head when I was coming up with thoughts. Uh, most of the time we're talking about print rights or print and ebook rights. Uh, mm -hmm. When I, when I uh, sold my translation rights to Germany for the Book of Deacon trilogy, they had said foreign rights, which is fairly broad, and I asked them to specify, because if that, I don't want them to have like, audio rights if Everything, they don't want yeah. it or or uh, or film rights but what about audio rights well, like like you never like you seldom hear about translations for indies but you never hear about translated audiobooks for indies like how far should you be casting the net this sort of thing again it depends how granular you want to go i think that your job as the author is to protect the rights you want to keep and license the rights you want to license. So I would say um, with your German publisher, what I would have probably wanted in the contract was, um, you know, uh, uh, ebook rights for German language in Germany, uh, Switzerland, um, Austria, I think are the countries they would normally put together, or at least Austria, um, Germany. Uh, you know, with a seven year license that will expire then, you know, and then as a separate clause with audiobook rights for the same period, if these are not exploited within 24 months or something, then these revert to the author. Because actually, if you could get a German audiobook done at the same time as your ebook, that actually might be beneficial. So what I think is really important, and, and this is something that we've been concentrating a lot on is kind of understanding contract law around these different things, because the more granular you can make it, the better. So for example, you, you know, agreeing to foreign rights doesn't even make sense because like no. that, that just could be anything. Um, and I, a friend of mine gave me his contract the other day and it said um, book rights. And I was like, book what is the definition of book these days i mean that's just crazy in that was in a traditional publishing contract and I'm, it, this is called a rights grab um you know uh, and they kind of want everything so your 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 role as the rights holder the intellectual property asset owner which is what we are everybody um is to 
yes, get your books out there. So yes, you want to sign these types of contracts, but you want the contract to be what you want it to be and protect the rights you don't want to give. So for example, if a publisher wants world English rights for all formats, <laughs> um, that yeah. is a bad, yeah, that's a bad contract to sign. And yet so many authors sign it because they think, oh, well, that means the publisher will publish my book in every country in the world in every format, which never happens. So this is the thing, just be really careful what you're signing, but go after what you want. So of course, Germany has audiobooks. So so get on Google, find the biggest audiobook producer in Germany and pitch them with your German sales of Book of Deacon and say, hey, this is doing really well in print and ebook. You know, are you interested in the audiobook rights? Not a bad idea. I have to say that the one really responsible thing I did in my entire uh, uh, indie author career was when I was first approached for the translation rights of the Book of Deacon. I talked to a lawyer and put together a, uh, a contract, if for no other reason, to be able to compare that contract, which was in my favor, to the contracts I might be offered in the future. And it's helped me out on three different occasions. So time that, well spent. Yeah, that's really good. And um, there's a book by Christine Catherine Rush, which I recommend every everybody reads and I, I'm blanking on the name of the book <laughs> but it's a book on contracts um, look for contracts Christine Catherine Rush is a great book um, all about that type of thing but it's interesting because as indies I, I just want to kind of you know one yes we want to get our stuff out there and we really you know off but often we undervalue ourselves and it's it's very important to have this longer term thinking when you're considering your intellectual property rights so for example someone came to me and said oh hey you know we're a we do games, board games. We'd love. We're doing like a Cluedo game. We'd love to include one of your characters uh, as a character on this board game. And I'm like, you know, my first response was awesome. That sounds great. You know, we all love that. And then I thought, oh, wait a minute. If I, how do I license one character into somebody else's game world? And then what if? And a movie studio wants to make films from my characters and wants to do merchandise, but I can't do that because I've licensed one character to a board game. So, you, I mean, obviously that may never happen, <laughs> but what if it does? So I decided that the short term potential wasn't worth the longer term opportunity to license that one um, character. Also, when I went to that company and said, well, what's your contract like? Can you send me over your draft contract? And they said, we don't have one. <laughs> That's when you walk flag. away. Yeah, <laughs> run for the hills. If people don't have a contract, what are you doing? I mean, even Lindsay and I working together with um, with Jay Thorne and Zach Bohannon, we sorted out the contract about six months before we went to New Orleans because as far as we were concerned, contractually, we're together seven, until 70 years after we die. <laughs> Right. So it's really important to sort these types of things out. Yep, uh, absolutely. Uh, all right, that's that's the last of my questions. I'll hand you off to Jeff to wrap things up. All righty. Uh, let's see here. The, the, the question I have for you, the first one is, uh, in your experience, has there been any resource you're familiar with which might indicate which genres are popular in foreign countries? I mean, for example, paranormal romance is on the rise in Europe. Mysteries are popular with Italians media is are you aware of any site that might actually tell you what's selling the best where uh, just go to the Amazon site for that country so um, if people don't know there are actually different Amazon sites amazon.com is not the only site <laughs> you'd be yeah, surprised Amazon dot whatever essentially yeah, I'm aware yeah of that. so if you want to have a look at Germany go to amazon.de and have a look what's selling and if people also didn't in fact Lindsay didn't know this I'll call her out on it you need to do your Amazon author central for these different sites so do your Amazon author central for the UK everybody do it for Germany do it for uh, they don't all have one but Italy um, Japan uh, but definitely Germany has a separate one um, Spain uh, so dot es so you know go find hopefully if you're getting money from those sites if you get royalties from every Amazon site um, then you'll be seeing all the different sites and I love getting all the different payments from all the different sites so um, you know amazon.com.mx from Mexico you can go see what's selling there so that's the ecosystem that we all sell in so that's probably the best place to start um, there are also lots of um, but you know look up the biggest traditional publisher like what i do is you know if i want to know um what the publishers are doing in my niche i i go um 
publisher Dan Brown China and go and look at what that publisher is doing at that point in time. And that sort of helps. So basically, Google is your friend, and that's probably the way to find out. Oh, I should also mention for the Amazon Author Central, you can actually take your, in my, my case, my, my Amazon US credentials, and I can log into the UK side, the Australia mm. side, and then, you know, depending on how good your, your German and your French are, you can log into their sites and, and make changes there. Because most of the time, you can actually go there and you can actually translate the page. But I mean, the first time yeah. I ever messed with it, yeah, I, I didn't even know I could log into the, the Amazon UK side. Until I tried it, like, what do you know? It works. So Canada, you know, UK, Italy, France, I mean, you name it, you can do it there. Yeah, a little, um, another little tip before you carry on. So um, when you guys do Goodreads giveaways, I hope people do Goodreads giveaways. They're really, they're really good. You can select the countries that you want um, to do the giveaways in. So say someone wins in Australia, you can actually log on to the site in Australia and send books from there. Or you like if someone wins in the UK, you log on to Amazon.co.uk and send your book from here, and that will save you. So whenever I do giveaways in the US, I just log on to Amazon.com and send them directly from there so that's a good tip if you're doing international giveaways to um so you don't have to you know pay all the american shipping uh, that is a, i mean i didn't even think about that that's a good side so if you do that just make sure when you when you're doing the goodreads giveaway don't put the little word sign yeah exactly print copy in there or else yeah. you are stuck for the damn darn yeah, that's why i just handling. print only yeah yeah. Okay. All right. Let's see here. And uh, so the next question I have, if you don't mind me asking, can, can we ask what does some, what would someone expect to pay to have their book professionally translated to another language? I mean, does it depend on the language, or does it fall squarely it, with the it hands? It depends of the on the length of the book. <laughs> oh, that would make sense. <laughs> Um, but you know, you you yeah. It depends on the length of the book, the level of the translator you're doing, the country. Um, yeah. I mean, there is no there is no price that one could say but go All on right, baby, so, go on so, baby so, and they yeah, might so have if, some information so if someone comes up to you and says oh hey i could do, translate this into spanish for you for a hundred bucks more than likely turn around and run yeah <laughs> <laughs> was, the last couple of times i looked into it it was to get it professionally done it was expensive yeah i mean in the same way that if you want a professionally done audiobook you're probably going to pay 1500 two grand you know um right. it's going to be more than that basically you, these are, they, I think it's very important for us all to remember that we are professionals working with other professionals. So if you're working with a professional editor, you pay them as a professional and cover designers, um, translators, you know, all of these people are professionals, audio narrators, you know, I love my narrators and I pay them good money. So um, these are professionals also working in our industry. So if you want to do this stuff, then do it professionally and um, budget for it. All righty. And we already touched on it a little bit briefly, but my last question for you is, uh, if approached, many of us authors would jump at the chance to see our books translated into, let's say, another language. Are there any red flags to be on the lookout for should the, should the situation ever present itself? Obviously, price being a factor. If someone says, oh, yeah, sure, 100 bucks, I'll do it for you. Or else, I mean, wh yeah, well, what are the red flags can you think of? Well, I think we've talked about it, which is the contract. Um, mm -hmm. because if or you lack with, thereof. Yeah, or lack thereof. If you're working with anyone, you must do a contract. Um, I mean, especially, for example, translators in Germany actually own a piece of your intellectual property rights. So if, you know, I had a German translator, but she lived in England, so that didn't apply. <laughs> but um, there are different rules all over the world, so you have to just be very careful. And But I, I, think, I think the main point on all of this is don't obsess about translation. Um, get on with your English language books, which is where you're going to make the most money. And people speak English all over the world. So you're going to, you know, I've sold books in 83 countries in English. So focus on English first and then look at licensing your um, foreign rights uh, if the opportunity presents itself and do a decent contract. But otherwise, I would just focus on writing and marketing your books in English. Yeah, I've, I've had the same sort of thing where I, one day I was just curious to see like which how many countries I've sold in, and that's the the power of Amazon is like sixty one or sixty two, and and I had family and friends say, well, God, how much did it cost to translate the book? And I was like, yeah, English is spoken in quite a few countries, so they want to read an English book. I've got one available. Have at it. So it, it works out well. But alrighty, that's it for my questions there. Let me hand you over to Lindsay. We'll see if we can wrap this up for you. Yeah, thanks for staying a little bit extra. I've 
think it's been a lot of information, a lot of good stuff for people. So we really appreciate it. Why don't you just close by reminding us of the name of the third edition, the new book, and where people <laughs> can edition. find you online? I have it here. <laughs> How to market mm. a book, third edition, available now in ebook, print, and audiobook. And you can always buy it direct from my website if you like buying direct from the author. Um, so yeah, that's available now. And of course, I have lots of other books. And I have a podcast, the Creative Pen Podcast, if you'd like to pop over and join me there. And if you have any other questions, you can always tweet me at the Creative Pen with a double N. Awesome. And I will put all your links in the show notes too. This is episode 139. And you can find us at marketingsff.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. And thanks for joining us, Joanna. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for hanging out with us, Joanna. So long, everybody.